Jesus. Welcome to the workshop for tonight, Thursday, February 28th. Can I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Here. Mrs. Caz Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Sider? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Okay. If you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> uh, 4.0. The workshop tonight is 4.1, the state of the state. And with us is Todd Jepson, Director of Buildings. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. State of the state. State of the state. State of school facilities. <clears throat> so thank you, uh, Todd Jepson. I've been the facilities director here since 2010. Uh, I got to live through the Wentworth planning and construction project and a little lovely years, several years of the old one. And uh, as I look at our facilities now, it's interesting to see how things have changed, but um, if I can figure out how to run this thing, I'll be good. I'll start us right here. So I thought I have a brief uh, presentation uh, through the slides and then a time for questions, comments, and however <coughs> else you'd like to respond to this type of information. <coughs> I, I put pictures of each of the schools up and uh, the dates uh, with these buildings coincide with their construction slash addition slash renovation dates. I did not put the dates of the addition of all the trailer classrooms that are attached to four of the six of these buildings. So the high school really is four buildings in one. Those are the dates where they were all built and added on. The middle school was built in 96. Wentworth, as you all know, opened just a few years ago in 14. And then the oldest of the K-2 schools is the Pleasant Hill School, then Eight Corners, then Blue Point. And they were all renovated uh, and added on to in 1992, one giant project. So uh, in terms of overall facilities, they have, uh, many of them were built quite a while ago, but have been renovated and worked on ever since. Um, in general, uh, we do the best we can to maintain the facilities we have. It is nearly 700,000 square feet of building space, which is a lot. It's about 680, actually. If you count the lovely bus transportation building, it's a little bit more than that. <clears throat> so where we have been, uh, again, we went through a long uh, four-year process to get the old Wentworth removed and the new Wentworth built. Uh, since that time, we have engaged with Harriman, architects and engineers, to produce a long-range facilities plan, uh, and you may or may not have seen that yet. It has already uh, changed. Our, our interest and our direction for the district has changed. Um, we discussed everything from <clears throat> increased enrollment uh, to declining enrollment. Even as recently as five years ago, we were talking about closing the Pleasant Hill School and redistributing the students and figuring out how that works and then as we uh, did a an update to our enrollment projections in 2016 we saw that enrollment would be increasing again and that closing Pleasant Hill wouldn't be an option so Harriman re-engaged with us to uh, consider really everything from uh, adding on to existing buildings to consolidating and building a large consolidated primary school that may even include pre-kindergarten um, we're, we're sort of in a holding pattern right now, but I'd like to thank uh, the three new board members, Nick and April and Sarah, for jumping on the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee because we've already gotten in, rolled up our sleeves, and started learning about those uh, challenges that we face now. So, <clears throat> the immediate needs. Um, <laughs> You know, and I started thinking about the middle school and the primary school. We, we really kind of have reached the tipping point, and it's not all and solely uh, based upon enrollment. In fact, our enrollment is lower now than it was in 2010 when I arrived. There were over 800 students at the middle school, and both of the trailer classroom uh, buildings were being used for students. <clears throat> but the difference now is the fact that 
um, we have a different way of using our, our spaces. There are different needs in the buildings. Um, there used to be a mix, if I'm correct, Diane, of uh, the three grades in the middle school, six, seven, and eight, were mixed and kind of flowed in and out of that, that portable that they're in now. And now the sixth grade is in that complex. And it's, uh, it's interesting, too, because back in 2010, we weren't thinking about school safety in the same way that we're thinking about it today. So if you look at our biggest concerns, uh, particularly at the middle school, but really at all schools, um, <clears throat> our priority concern is student and staff safety. So the Scarborough Middle School sixth grade temporary trailer classrooms have been there since 2000. And I put that up there intentionally to say they're temporary since 2000. It doesn't take a math major <clears throat> to realize that 19 years is not temporary. In fact, 19 years is uh, almost four times the age of the Wentworth School already. So uh, we have a challenge. If you look at, I'm going to pass this around because Diane and Dave from the middle school produced this um, sheet. Dr. Netto, you mean? Dr. Netto, <laughs> courier, uh, produced <clears throat> this sheet. Uh, when we applied for state funding for renovations two years ago in 2017 um, to help share information about the reality at the middle school. Now, this information, you don't have to digest it all now, it's just good to, to know. When you think about students having to walk back and forth from that building to the main building every day, multiple times a day, in our current environment, uh, everything from things we should be used to as Mainers, like the weather, to uh, strange people walking into the building, which just happened a couple weeks ago, um, to delivery trucks driving across the crosswalk that children eating lunch in the hallways. There, There is just a, a real tipping point at that middle school that, that just makes it inadequate in, in many, many ways. And I, I don't need to, to pontificate forever on that, but um, I was a school teacher for about seven years right out of college, and I taught high school English. And it was out of boarding school, so the kids are walking outside all the time, but it's much more like a college campus, which is much more secured than this. So this is a public road. People come in looking for the library. They think it's a through road and they can get through and they end up right in front of the building. It is, it is definitely a scary thing. And I took these pictures because the one on the left was taken uh, for our DOE application. So you can see students walking. Um, just weather alone, when it's slippery and snowing or raining during the day, kids slip and fall, teachers slip and fall. Um, it's Im impossible sometimes to keep after that. And then <clears throat> the picture on the right that's the very crosswalk that the kids are coming by. And if you keep coming in the direction that that truck is facing, uh, that's where all the delivery trucks come in. They're trailer trucks. And there's garbage trucks and all, every kind of service vehicle you might imagine. So you really do have to be paying attention. We've done lots of things to change the traffic flow in and out of that building. Uh, public safety does not like the location. They're trapped in there. It's sort of a dead end, circle in, circle out. It has lots of things that, that really create compromise. So when you look at the building, not just only from safety, but from programmatic delivery, it's a challenge. And one of the realizations that Dave Courier helped us understand the other night is that because of the safety protocols that they have to uh, participate in each day at that school, it really does detract from the program that they're trying to deliver. Uh, we have schedules unlocking and locking doors. We have push button access entry. We have camera watching and, and unsupervised kids. It's just, it's just amazing. If you ever want to watch an exciting day, go to the main office of the middle school and watch the, how the transactions happen because it's, it's, it's a challenge. So that is a, is a big priority and concern. <clears throat> the second challenge in facilities that we see are the primary schools, and really all schools, because of annual space usage and allocation changes, 
it's not just class sizes it's it's what is the program that's running in the building so this is eight corners um, for those of you who have been there you've seen that um, the special needs uh, class sizes have increased and the needs of those students has changed and varied over the years such that some of the specialized equipment that these children need uh, there's no place to store it so it sits in the hallway um, bathrooms are generally inadequate special needs space in the primary schools is generally not up to standard um, if you compare it to what we have say at Wentworth um, it's just vastly different um, some of these children need toileting assistance or full-on care in that department and there isn't really uh, an appropriate bathroom for these kids um, and it's a little sad and we modify and adjust and adapt um, behavior management also there is no um, quiet space um, to really use in these primary schools so we the maintenance department and I have this term that we use we call it sanitizing a classroom where we basically have to take anything out of the room that a child could hurt him or herself on or with and we basically make it as safe as possible um, we did build a quiet room in eight corners this past summer um, but again it's one small space so if you have multiple students it's difficult to manage that uh, eight uh, blue point we've taken a whole classroom and and sanitize that to try and make it safe for the child or children um, we also have uh, academic program challenges at the high school um, you know these these they don't have a stem classroom they have nice science labs uh, but they don't have any that are dedicated specifically for stem curriculum so we're challenged to find space there um, and uh, from season to season we we are challenged with moving equipment around and storing it from season to season I I I get asked a lot by a lot of different departments if we can store this equipment or this stuff in these various places in buildings because we're not using it now but we're going to need it later so there's a lot of shuffling around so storage is also a challenge at times um, enrollment changes from year to year uh, as I as you all know we're increasing enrollment I believe Allison told me that there are 10 additional special needs students coming to eight corners next year um, which will require uh, more rooms for those kids for example a general education classroom may have 13 15 18 kids in it a uh, special needs classroom may have four to six and each of those kids may have an adult with them so you understand how uh, a classroom that was really designed for maybe 15 or 20 kids and now has six in it puts pressure on all the other rooms to try and uh, find space for those classes so that's a uh, big challenge there <coughs> uh, in the immediate world we have been working with two uh, firms Harriman uh, and Goral Palmer so this is an overview of the eight corner school um, if you ha also want to watch something that's alarming uh, go to eight corners at drop-off but m even more alarming pickup time at the end of the day um, there is really no place for traffic to flow in and out of that school currently as you look at that picture on the right hand side uh, where it says portable one and portable two that's the uh, staff parking lot and on the left hand side as you're coming in there's some more additional parking but that's also the bus loop the bus drop-off section so what happens there is sort of a mishmash of uh, maybe rushed and grumpy people dropping off and picking up their kids and getting trapped behind buses and doing quick hurried things not thinking and backing out against traffic and trying to squeeze out using handicap parking spaces uh, that they shouldn't be using and and just we're really lucky that no one's been run over in that building uh, just because of the traffic pattern so we've been working with Goral Palmer who really specializes in traffic pattern and flow um, and you know obviously there's not enough land there to make a dedicated bus loop um, but what we decided after several weeks of planning and traffic watching and monitoring is if we could create uh, in that right hand parking lot uh, make that really the parent drop off parking lot because these folks of these really tiny little children they don't just dump their kid off and leave they actually walk the child in so they really need a parking space um, they can't really park now because that's full of staff parking on the right so the, the darker gray on the left 
is the uh, proposed and really planning board approved parking lot for an additional uh, 32 spaces and that would become the staff parking lot and then the parking lot on the right can be the place where the, where the parents uh, can safely drop or more safely drop off their children. And I would just add, it's not that the parents would have to park and drop their child off. If there's a proper drop-off loop, they could just pull up and drop off, but there's only that bus loop. So we have to ask parents to park and drop their child off. Um, in some of the other schools, they're able to make a drop-off loop like within the parking lot, but you can't even turn your car around in that. No, and the and the buses often will stack side by side yeah. in that in that bus lane, which is right on top of the nose in parking. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll involve some configuration. That's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar proposition. That parking lot. Um, the other again pinch you heard about is the enrollment or the curriculum uh, program changing, which is really going to require some extra space. So you'll see. Um, the different colored boxes. The original plan uh, was to just extend with uh, additional temporary, I call them trailers because that's what they are. They come rolling in on wheels and then they set them on blocks and they leave the wheels right under them. Um, the orange uh, box was the original plan to have two classrooms. Uh, as we sat in our last long range planning committee meeting, it became uh, a reality that perhaps there is a need for more than just two classrooms so I asked our design folks to go back and propose sort of the best location that would maybe be the most economical to add classroom space and I know it looks like it's right smack dab in the middle of the site and it is but the two uh, boxes that say P1 and P2 with the diagonal lines through it those are the potentially proposed locations of four classrooms um, that would ev eventually be attached in that in that alcove. Is there a pointer on this thing? Yeah. How do I use it? <laughs> Sorry. The red at the bottom. It looks like it's a power button. Yeah, so this is currently a walkway, and that little breezeway connects the modulars. Sorry, Dylan. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to blind you with my, um, and, and this would be enclosed, and so the, kid, the students would be able to walk through here and then come out and go back in, and then there's two little doorways there that would most likely be required for egress, fire egress. And then the one on the far end, they'd have to come out and because uh, if it came straight out, we'd lose three or four parking spaces. So that's why we set it back and offset it a little bit to the other one. So, I mean, the whole purpose was to get as many parking places as possible. So it didn't make sense to us to make a straight addition and take uh, three or four parking places and a light post. <laughs> So we haven't made the final decision as to what, uh, whether we'll have two or four because it's, it's about finances and how, how do we afford it and pay for it. You can buy them, you can lease them, you can lease them to buy them. So uh, if, if we truly are going to consider them temporary, uh, to me, leasing is the way to go and the way you should go. Um, if, if you want to make a temporary building permanent like we've done at the middle school, then buying is what you really should do because the economics don't make sense after for that period of time. So, so Todd, the current portables that are at eight corners, are the, we own those? We own them. We own all the existing temporary classrooms. And at the primary schools, they're all attached. They're not like the middle school, so you don't have the same safety concerns. You have, every time you add an extension to a building, you have to add additional exterior doors, which is a safety concern. But we have, you know, a reasonably good security system with access control and, and cameras and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that is less of a concern. But when you have them detached and you have students migrating between the two buildings multiple times a day, uh, that gives me heartburn. Would you explain why the middle school ones are not attached to the building? Yes. Um, I should have brought a site plan for the middle school, but I didn't. So uh, it's a space issue. It's a site space issue and a utilities issue. So at the middle school, if you've all been there, if you come into the teardrop and come around the parent drop-off or bus loop, if, if you were to take a hard right uh, and go back behind the school to go to a softball game, let's just say, um, all the utilities that feed that building are right underneath that pavement. So you have water, you have sewer, you have gas. Everything's under the ground. And 
in order to attach something, you got they're on frost walls, they dig a hole, you're going to disrupt that service. If we're going to properly add on to the middle school, it would be a significant task because you'd have to move the utilities because you'd have to correctly size the cafeteria. And the only way to do that is to push it out. You have to right size everything, and all gym. the common spaces, all the gym, common spaces. library, cafeteria, art rooms would have to be added and changed around. So it, it would be, I think Harriman's two years ago, their rough ballpark estimate for a renovation and expansion at the middle school to remove the modulars, portables, trailers, whatever you want to call them, was over $18 million, 17 or $18 million, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Just but to remove them? No, just no, to, to, to correctly that. size, oh, yeah, to correct, oh, to remove so them, that's that's the easy, cheap part. <laughs> I've, I've never seen the middle school, like, from an aerial view like that. Mm -hmm. Is it, like, you, could you build up on it? Yes. No, no, no that's because the, what I, we, I mean, it I looks so flat could, on top, I was just wondering. I think we could in one of the design plans that Harriman showed us, um, but the mm. issue you would have is having to totally, all your core spaces are in the center. Right, so they don't have to be reconfigured. Right. It's not just as easy as adding classrooms. And if you look at the top of this picture, these wings are the, the regular, uh, the classroom wings that go yeah. out this way. Um, if we go out towards the softball field, that back in that woods, you'd, you'd have to get into the woods um, and you'd, you'd run into wetland issues because there's wetland brooks and things right back in there. It's not impossible, but then you'd foul up your baseball field part. Sorry the pun there. Uh, I didn't mean that really. <laughs> I really didn't. Uh, and then if you go out the other way toward the baseball field, there is a vernal pool right in the back. Literally just inside the woods edge, there's a vernal pool, which is very protected environmental structure by the DEP. So pushing it out further along those classroom hallways is very, very difficult. And Joanne could give you the history on the middle school. We knew that this middle school was too small at the time it was being built. And so the DOE did approve extra classrooms, which is the longer, the hallway. longer, right? But they didn't increase any of the lar of the common spaces. And, you know, the other challenge that you have is the way that it's designed, because it was a state-funded <clears throat> project. It's all minimum specs. And so if you've been in the middle school hallways, you notice they sort of converge. So as you get, you know, middle school bodies into spaces that aren't really adequate in terms of the width for passing in the hallway. Yep. Um, the biggest challenge for me, and I'm going to advance to the next slide, and there'll be time for you to ask all the questions you'd like uh, at the end, but I, I'd like to get through. I had to put a couple of boring pictures on there <laughs> for a facilities nerd like myself. So keeping up to date and operationally efficient is sort of the operating guideline I have in the facilities department. We have four maintenance people that we employ for the six buildings. Again, it's not a difficult math equation. We don't have one person per building. And that doesn't count custodians. Custodians don't do maintenance. They clean. So I have 30 custodians in the district <clears throat> between full and part time. So it costs the first bite on there is that it costs 35 to 36 percent and I put a variance there because I'm including primary and middle school it costs that much more to just just to heat and electrify the middle school and the primary schools than it does the Wentworth school and the comparison there I, I, I tried to make sure I was comparing two fully air-conditioned schools because the middle school is fully air-conditioned and so is Wentworth it's very difficult when you compare Wentworth to the high school the high school looks more efficient in a square footage and dollars per square foot calculation, but it's not fully air conditioned. So if I were to say which is the most efficient, Wentworth is by far the most efficient because if it, I gauge efficiency in more than just utility costs. Um, here's where the teacher in me comes out. If you have a kid in a 95 degree classroom on the second floor of the high school, I question what kind of quality teaching is going to take place with that child or those group of kids. Um, and we have cattle fans in the halls at the high school when it's hot. Huge mistake not to make, uh, air condition that high school when it was renovated, but we don't have it. Um, but Wentworth and Middle are, and it's still more than a third more efficient than these older buildings. And it's partly because of building envelope, the skin doors, walls, windows, roof of the building, and it's partly because we have aging infrastructure. They're hugely 
big capital investments. The things on the right, in the 27-year-old boiler at Blue Point School, that, that school we had to replace one of the boilers just a couple of years ago because it failed. Literally blew up and started barfing water all over the boiler and floor. It was done. So we had to have a second boiler. Um, the, the unit on the left, sorry, uh, <coughs> is a heat pump. It's 23 years old. They have a life expectancy of 15 to 20 years if they're well maintained. We have maintained these heat pumps really well and there are 123 of them at the middle school. And they don't all look like that. Some of them are, are smaller and they're up in places that you can't reach above the ceiling and it takes you know ripping the building apart to get at them to replace them or service them. Now we've replaced probably, I can't remember, 12 or 15. Um, in the, in the time that I've been here, and they fail when you need them. They fail when they're under m big heating loads or big cooling loads, and they, they die. So to update, you know, the, the heating and cooling infrastructure at the middle school is going to be large six figures, possibly even seven figures if you're to do it all at once. We've been piecing away at it, and those heat pumps range in price from about $4,000 to about $20,000 a piece, depending on their size and the gym ones, for example, are big and have a lot bigger output and a lot bigger space to heat and cool, so they cost more money to replace. Um, again, we did apply for state funding through the Department of Ed, uh, all four schools, middle and the three primaries. Uh, the highest on the list for the rating cycle for the Department of Ed was Eight Corner School, and it was 34th out of 88 or nine schools. I think it was 77 at the end. 77 at the end. So um, middle school was in the 50s. Yeah, and the DOE didn't even walk into the temporary, class temporary classrooms. classrooms because they said everyone has them. And when we told them that it had running water and plumbing, they said better than most. And they walked out. I think also they don't go into the trailers um, because they calculate the impact based on the fact that you don't have enough space within your actual building when they're giving you points for your enrollment needs. So they don't want to double count it, so to speak, depending on the quality of your, tra your trailers. Right. Um, final thing I wanted to, to say, and I know we've said it before during budget cycles, is that the Department <coughs> of Ed recommends that school department, local school departments spend 2% of the value of their physical plant annually on capital improvements. Our physical plant, when last assessed or evaluated, was about $150 million. I actually think it's significantly larger than that now. Um, but for what we have, $150 million. Um, Can you repeat that again? 2% of what? 2% of the value of your physical plant they recommend that you spend on capital investments annually. Thank you. Um, we have not come, so that for us, 2% would be about $3 million a year. <laughs> we have not spent $3 million Sorry. a year on capital improvements for facilities in the almost nine years I've been here. How much do we typically spend, Todd? Uh, less than a million. Um, I would say around, around a million, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Third. No. Does that You'll, include um, staff as well, or is it just? That's capital. That's just capital. That's replacing that's a roof. Themselves. Replacing the boilers. Replacing for main, big for windows. Maintenance, maintenance masonry. Um, I, if you if you look carefully at the middle school, you'll see two different colored windows in the front of the building. Some are these lovely mint green, favorite color of the '90s, I guess. And some are sort of this silverish gray. The silverish gray ones are brand new. I've had those put in since I've been here because they've started to leak. They leak heat. They leak water. We replace them. Um, but again, you have to ask for capital dollars to do that because one of those big windows is maybe $20,000. It's big. Um, but again, windows in all the K2 schools are 27 years old. And they feel drafty on the two days we had this week. <laughs> People are feeling the breeze. All right, I'll keep moving. Long-range planning considerations. In my opinion, there are three essential pieces to, effect, to uh, effective long-range planning. The first is effective planning. Uh, we, had, we demonstrated that with Wentworth. It was a four-year process. We had an amazing uh, planning committee. 
Um, we got a lot done. We agreed to disagree on some things, but we still moved through it and got a great building uh, and came in $2.8 million under budget. Um, time. It takes time. Four years to build a new school, more than six months to plan something like a parking lot. Um, and then the most critical, of course, is the funding. You've got to ask for money, and it comes out of your pockets as taxpayers. Or, if you're lucky enough, the state might give you some. I will say, when the state gives you money, there are lots of strings attached. <laughs> so you have to do it the way they want you to. So sometimes you don't get what you really want. You get what they'll pay for. So other considerations, efficiencies in the building envelope updates. I talked about windows and roofs and doors and walls. The insulation in the walls of the old section of the K2, school, K2 schools is R3. Supposed to be about our 30, 28, I think. Um, it's really under, under inadequate. Um, solar. I have a, a picture of solar up there. I've been working with the Ecos Group. I have a proposal from Revision Energy for solar panels on the roof of the high school and Wentworth to help defray our electrical costs. Um, huge electrical expense to keep these buildings lit up, heated, and running. Um, Space usage and allocation changes, you have to stay on top of them all the time. I'm struggling to find a space for high school STEM um, that you can just turn, you can't just turn things into it that easily and it costs a lot of money to convert. Um, an unoccupied space like a storage area can't necessarily automatically just be turned into a student occupied space for a whole variety of reasons, but special needs, the ever changing special needs, the arts. You go to the K2 schools and they, some of them have a dedicated art room, some of them don't. Soon they might have art on a cart. It just depends, and it's you know it's 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 a type of challenge that and buildings like the high school in Wentworth, where you do have a lot of nice space and and dedicated space for these programs, it doesn't exist in the same way at the primary schools and now the overcrowded middle schools. Six hundred and seventy-six students at the middle school. So you're still 75 over enrolled there, but again, programmatic changes are huge. Recommendations. I recommend we change our vocabulary and stop, stop calling uh, temporary classrooms. Modulars, they sound kind of fun. Modulars are fun. And uh, they're not. They're really not fun at all. They're gross. <laughs> and they're a pain in the neck to work on. Uh, there are nine heating and cooling units on top of that portable at the high school, or uh, the tra tra trailer, trailer at the middle school. See, I have to train myself, too. Um, they are a trailer park. You have a trailer park that our sixth grade is going to at middle school. And I would recommend that you see the schools in action so you have an appreciation and understand the challenges that this staff faces on a daily basis because they, they have their challenges and they make it happen. And as a result, we've been victims of our own success. We make it happen. Oh, everything's fine. <coughs> sure. <laughs> in addition, and so my final recommendation is uh, in addition to the, and this came from our small group um, breakout um, for this team here with the school board members on it. In addition to that long range facilities planning committee, I would recommend developing a middle school and K2 building planning committee to address issues and respond more quickly to critical needs because, <clears throat> you know, critical needs happen all the time, but then we just don't have time in our busy work a day to just get on it. And, and these, the planning is what's critical to get stuff done effectively. So, if we, you know, you know, we're a service department in facilities. We do as best we can. We run around fixing things when we can, um, and we and we try to make everybody happy. But I think if we work as a higher level group here um, to make people happy, um, then maybe this will happen. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, I thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions you might have. I have some questions. I, so I live the eight corners nightmare mm. pretty frequently. Can you just go back to the sure. eight corners? Sure. You don't like my donkey? Yeah. No. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things you mentioned is that there's no bus loop. There's also no way to like, like if you pull into that right-hand parking lot mm -hmm. and you can't tell if their space is open or not when you're looking down there. So you yep. pull in. You have to make like a 52 point turn <laughs> yeah. to try and get back out again. Especially in the winter when right, there's snow cramping right. everything. So yeah. is, there, like, is there a solution to explain 
accessibility to those spaces? Um, Cause that, I mean, you know, when you're back, you know, and there's other kids getting out of cars and doors are opening and closing. The, the only I, solution is that if we remove all staffing from staff parking from there to that other side. Parking yeah, if you lot, move them from here to there, what you're, what you're, you experience is the fact that you have an already full parking lot right. and you might have six open spaces and 12 people look or 15 people looking to park their car. So some people have double parked. Most of the time they're parked along here and along this, uh, this is a and big uh, drainage well, pond. Most of the time they're parked along in front of those trees on Muzzy Road. Yeah, they're parked. That you can't see any yeah. traffic coming out. Yeah, we're you're parked along the there. Anymore. So our, our thinking was that there's a, a total between <clears throat> that parking lot and these spaces, there's 51 parking spaces. Okay. Our thinking is if you remove the roughly 28 to 30 or so staff to here, to 20, so you get 32 cars out of there, because this would hold 32, and then, then teachers would come in this way, so then you're, you're gonna basically have an em almost virtually an empty parking lot over to the right, which should alleviate some of that pinch point pressure you're feeling. And we'd, we thought, and we actually worked with Gower Palmer to consider making a loop, so you come in here, drop, and come out here, but this is a really steep, ditch drainage it's a natural one so we didn't create it and then the pond starts right there and the DEP just doesn't like digging up natural water structures and then bridging over designed engineered ponds and things like that so it was just a challenge to try and get a flow that that worked without putting kids in front of cars so our thinking was get them there get them over to the safe walkway on the school side and walk them in <clears throat> and I know this is probably like, I'm, I'm saying a dirty word here, but what if you got rid of the parking in the bus loop and mm -hmm. turn that into a double lane? Did you, I don't want to do your job, but this, like I said. Yep, no, we, we actually <laughs> talked about I that too. All the time. We actually did talk about that too. Um, so when you say a double lane, you're talking about a lane here and a lane there yeah. for, so like parents to drop off? Right, like but, if parents dropped off on the sidewalk and then buses dropped off. I mean, there would have to be somebody there, obviously, to... to yeah, and, th and that was the piece that we consider with Ann, was that you don't have the staff to, like, when a parent opens their door and there's a bus going by, you know, are they going to have their door ripped off? And you also can't have cars moving when a bus is there with its red flashing lights on. You can't have people going out. In fact, the day that our small committee was there, we had a gentleman who was parked in a car right here, Right beside these, there's two handicap spots right there. And he was in here, double stacked buses, yep. a full lane here and a double stacked bus there. And he backed out and he was thinking, oh, I'm going to get out. And then he saw the bus with the lights on. And he decided with all the traffic coming in and out to back his car out here <laughs> and get out. And there was a policeman there. And we were all yeah, standing not only there. Yeah, that, but there's a huge sign saying you can't go in there and right. park. Right. Right. It was it was it was great for you to see that. <laughs> they they scripted it. Yeah. They <laughs> it. <laughs> it wasn't it was staged. Like a daily you this never little leave this stuff. It was not park. staged. Stunt car. So, so no. do the other primary schools have similar issues with parking in space? Um, it's just we're no, just lucky. They have a different sort of a dedicated bus loop at Pleasant Hill. Yeah. And they've alleviated some of the parent drop-off pressure by having some of the teachers park out back behind the school in a big paved area. I think they can get seven or eight teachers to park out back, which is around the back, not quite to the playground. And they've freed up the center parking spaces for parents to be able to pull in, park, drop off their child, and come back out. It's Last not perfect, year. but it is Way better. significantly better than it was in the previous years. So Eight Corners is really the only one that needs yeah. to and, and and improvement. Yeah, and Blue Point. I would say the high school needs some improvements too, but we focused on eight corners. Yeah, Blue Point has that upper parking lot, and they kind of yeah. drop man. Can kind of they they still have to cross the bus lane, but generally they manage that pretty well. And at the high school, we've had some issues with you know double stacking buses and people you know getting off and running out in front as people try to pass. So we've done things with signs and you know saw horses saying you can't drive in here. And we had a girl get hit a couple of years ago, and she was getting off a bus and running into the parking lot to get something out of her car, and, you know. But yeah, there's, there's, there's a few things that need to be, or left to be desired. But the advantage of places like Wentworth and the high schools, you just have vast parking areas. Mm -hmm. So people can park and, I mean, although drop off, if Kelly Crosby were here, drop off at Wentworth is pretty interesting to watch in the morning. <laughs> Everybody's in a hurry. 
So. Yeah. Or even in the afternoon when people are coming to pick up their kids, they make their own parent pickup loop that's right by the handicap spots, and so. Yeah. I have a planning question. Yes. So, at some point, our community is going to have to have a really sincere and serious conversation mm -hmm. about our primary schools, mm -hmm. and um, whether or not we keep. <laughs> the three primary schools we have now, or make a decision to do a different model where we build one primary school mm -hmm. in the center of town. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated what you said about planning. Mm -hmm. You know, if, we, if that, you know, whatever we do with the primary schools, down the road, but we need to have a good plan. Mm -hmm. Before we have, have a, before we can have a good plan, we need to really have that conversation with the community. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your planning and your discussions, where do you see, where and when do you see, when do you see that occurring? In terms of really start trying to get, you know, to kind of flush that out. Because I can see the pros and cons of both. Mm -hmm. I love the primary school. Yeah. My kids, I mean, I don't, Blue Point, I mean, <coughs> but uh, um, I also see the challenges mm -hmm. that um, you have with, yep. Yeah, you know, the facilities and the planning going forward. Yeah, so I, I see it as a, you know, the, 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 I agree with you. The community needs to make a decision. Right? Do you want to keep with the nostalgic neighborhood schools where you can walk your child or, or have a very short drive to school because you live nearby? Um, or do you want to opt for something that's ultimately more efficient and probably better programmatically overall for the students and staff? And that decision is going to need time. Yes. Which is your second point. Yep. So, like, I mean, it's going to be a, a hard conversation mm -hmm. over probably multiple years. Yeah, and so it like, started. When do we, when do we start to have well, that So I think Todd's call to action for his recommendations is just that. Amy, right. is we need to, as a board, talk about the formation of a couple of different building committees, one for the middle school and one for this idea centered around the primary mm -hmm. schools, because those conversations need to start happening, and the long-range planning committee like Todd said, we're we're busy talking about the eight corners parking lot and the <laughs> module in the trailers that we're gonna Thank do you. right now. <laughs> and so we're you know, we spend maybe ten or fifteen minutes talking about like, you know, well where where would a site be if we were gonna talk about doing like a centralized primary school and then the meeting's over and you know. So I think like a building focused group. So we started this work in twenty sixteen pretty much as soon as I was hired, looking at the current what was then the current long range facilities mm -hmm. plan, looking at those enrollment numbers. Um, and we went through a, a, a long range planning process with Harriman and came up with literally, I think it was like A through H by mm -hmm. the time we were done mm -hmm. options. options. Um, and that's our most current plan. Mm -hmm. And then the board in November 2017 s decided on the best plan would be to build a consolidated school and then started thinking about where would the site be for that um, and when we started just just very softly testing that with the community um, there was lots of passion around just that don't you dare touch our neighborhood schools um, <laughs> and and also then we were in the midst of this comprehensive planning process in our community and we really need to fall into line with the other priorities of the community. Mm -hmm. So this is, I would say, top, in our minds, the most urgent need in the community, but for other folks, something like a community center or expansion of the library or the public safety building felt like it was a bigger priority. Correct. Um, and so we also have to fit inside, you know, what will the community support and, and at what pace can that happen? And I think the hard part for us is that this isn't a nice to have. We don't get to decide whether or not we want to have, you know, students come to school. <laughs> They're going to show up, and we have to be ready. And so um, I think that's been the hard part for us is just trying to navigate that politically. So now that we know, and this was before we even knew about the beacon or knew about the downs, so um, I think that we're right there doing that again, saying let's rethink this. And it could be three um, it could be adding a fourth neighborhood school if we really like that the concept of the smaller primaries. But we also do need to be future ready, mm -hmm. which means we have to be ready for preschool. It's coming. Seventy percent of the schools in Maine already have some form of public preschool, yeah. and um, we're missing out on opportunities to actually receive some state funding to help us with with establishing a preschool because we just don't have the space right now. 
So to answer your question, I, I look to you as community members, board members, to initiate mm -hmm. the, the the onus is on you all to, to make to make those conversations start happening. The heartburn I have about the neighborhood schools is, I mean, strictly from a facility standpoint, they're remarkably inefficient. You triplicate no everything. We have six boilers instead of two. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, three sets of everything, three locations to go um, it, 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 there. I, and if you built a fourth one, you'd quadruple that inefficiency, A, and B, that fourth school would be so much farther ahead of all the other three that you wouldn't get away without having to update those other three to get them somewhat closer. Right. And that's quadruple the money because you'd have to do it in three places plus have the expense of the fourth Not school. Not to mention just the annual staffing right. challenges. So, so I mean, as enrollment shifts, yeah. you know, in 2017-18, we could have conserved five yeah. teaching positions alone based on our enrollment numbers if we were in one building. Yep. It's, yeah, so it's remarkably inefficient to have three and four or whatever many, you know, locations for these schools. But again, it's not, I understand it's not all about me. It's not yeah. all about money. It breaks me. So sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to let go of what you love mm -hmm. right, without having a clear picture of what you could get. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we have to. Care. <laughs> well, I mean, and I would, you know, I, I get it, but like I think, I think that's how hard our task is, mm -hmm. because we have to be ready to promote something that people can't really visualize, and they can't get their head around yeah, it. You're right. So, yeah. oh, it's also going to come with a price tag. Yeah. Well, so yeah, if we can fine. get people's minds wrapped into whether it's a single school or overhauling them all. There's going to be a gigantic price cost. Right. Right. We have to sell the dream and then get right. people behind paying so, for it. <laughs> but Todd, like speaking of price tags, am I correct in saying, like this is not going to be the first hundred, <laughs> like what did you say, two hundred twenty-five thousand? Two hundred fifty thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars we're going to have to pay to just to be able correct. to hold school in That's these correct. schools. That's correct. So I guess my point is like, okay, we can add a parking lot and four classrooms to eight corners this year and then like... Or trailers. Or trailers, sorry. But like, what's to say next year eight corners won't need two more trailers right. and Blue Point right. will need... That's going to happen. Uh, At Pleasant Hill, you'll need two trailer classrooms right. next year. Right. So we'll take care of eight corners for the short time being this year. Then you'll throw a Band-Aid on Pleasant Hill with two more in that paved area, and then you'll have the parking nightmare all over again. Which is why we want, we started this conversation in 2016, and so there's no avoiding that at this point. We needed to, we right. needed to have community support and action back then. Right. Um, I think that the other part to remember is that adding these trailers, depending if we add two or four, you're talking... A, hundreds of thousands of dollars just separate from the two hundred and fifty thousand right. dollar parking right yeah. and that has to happen for whether you year. buy them or lease them you're going to be well, paying I think what's money. scary is that you don't know how long that band-aid is going to last you Correct. could get needs coming <clears throat> in next year or in two years right. or in three years that right. would require even more right and again it's not a just about enrollment it's about programmatic and, need. Yeah, and yeah that's a good point yeah. i think too. and uh you know i i just look at that and say Think about your car. I know a building's supposed to last 50 years, all right? So the main buildings of all these primary schools have been 50 years on all of them. And you have to ask yourself the question of, like, uh, you know, am I going to replace the engine and transmission in a 15-year-old car with 250,000 miles on it? You would all look at me and say, absolutely not. What a waste. So now you're faced with that in a building, and it's a much bigger dollar figure. Do I rip the chassis out of this old dog? And breathe new life into it and hope she makes it 50 more years. But you love the old dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know. I have a question. I'm with you. Quick one. I know. I, They're clean. And I'm I kidding, but not They are kind of neat and homey little places. Um. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. Homey? Yeah. Homey. Oh, homely. 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 <laughs> <laughs> a little homely. <laughs> is the picture for eight corners, and this is a long range mm -hmm. planning question because we saw mm -hmm. the previous plan, but. Mm -hmm. Is the orange two trailers? Two. It's two okay. classrooms, yeah. Okay. And then the red is two more. It's four more. Well, if you do the one with a hash, that's two, and then the little dotted line one would be two oh, more. Oh, okay. So, so they'd be four in the total red box. So you have so a variety two, of options. Two in there. So the orange would be omitted in the yeah, red it, plan. Yeah, so we'd or either... Or not, you could... 
We'd either do this oh, one no. only, yeah. or we'd maybe do this one only, or you'd do both of those. But if you I did gotcha. both of these, you wouldn't necessarily do I gotcha. that one. I gotcha. And is, is there's a connector, like arrow? Mm -hmm. Would the connector be part of this with the trailers, or are we asking the littles? Here? They would yes. be inside. It would they be would in, be inside. Yeah. Yeah, I would, okay. I would enclose yeah, that. I would, I would totally enclose that. I just want to make sure yeah. that we're not asking them to do what our middle school students are doing. <laughs> they wouldn't I be crying. Agreed. Agreed. It takes them 20 100%. minutes just to put their coat and boots on. <laughs> <laughs> the lot of instructional time alone. <laughs> just making sure. Well, I mean, think about those, think about the children in those classrooms right there making their way to the cafeteria for lunch. Because okay. oh. they're not going to go this way. They're going to go here, 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 and there. That's, yeah. that's, You're going to need a nap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're going to need a break. You need a potty break on the way. You know, so, so. Wait, Ta, I have one more question going way back to the high school. You were talking about like the 90 degree um, mm -hmm. classrooms, and I know like this, I know you guys this are probably like, oh my God. <laughs> this past year, we actually had to close school because of that. So is there a plan to remediate that? How much money do you want to spend? <laughs> Anything's possible with time and money. That's okay. my philosophy. Yeah. And we actually looked into uh, air conditioning a couple of different wings of the high school. It's six figures. Okay. Because you didn't is do it at the beginning. The school, it's not impossible. Air conditioned? Excuse me? Is any of it air conditioned? Yes. Um, the main office, the, ma the administrative offices, the cafeteria, the auditorium, the library, um, and the special needs uh, main classroom are all so air conditioned. Like Yep, and the all-purpose room, that big meeting room across from that, that's air conditioned. There was a bunch of us who tried to convince people at the high school to put air, make it an air-conditioned building. But when it was and, I, and I had the special needs wing air-conditioned because of the summer program, and they had some children with respiratory issues, and it simply, it's just going to breathe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we air conditioned them after the fact. Well, I mean, I can only assume there's children with respiratory issues yeah. throughout the whole so district. The whole district. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. If you've ever been in eight corners on a day when it's 85. If you'd ever like to see what it takes to air condition, say, a classroom wing, I would be happy to take you on an air handler <laughs> tour of the high school. <laughs> Trust me, you'll never ask to go again. <laughs> and on those days, it's the, the high school administrators running around with, you know, devices to determine whether or not the air quality is appropriate and protecting well, them multiple like, times. I mean, we actually had to close school, plus, like, the lack the loss of instructional time other than that by yeah. just having kids when, unable to concentrate us. When we opened the middle school, um, because it was built in 1996 and it was an air-conditioned building, which was pretty much unheard of back then, we kept a record of any time it was over 80 degrees and what was happening in the building. And at the end, I, at that first year, I did a report, which was that over the course of the, this first year, we gained 20 days of learning because they were over 80 degrees, and our kids thought it was wonderful in the building. They weren't thinking it was hot outside or anything like that. And many times, they would go to leave the building, and they would stop, like, do I have to go home? It's too hot, you know? Mm -hmm. But the kids were learning. The teachers were fine. And, and when we were at the old middle school, I mean, the old Wentworth school, we had numerous um, rescue calls for mm -hmm. asthma attacks and so mm -hmm. forth. And at the middle school in the five years, the um, first five years, no, the first five years at the middle school, oh, we never had one. Wow. So there is a significant, mm -hmm. um, you know, benefit to having the building air conditioning. Well, I assume, does air conditioning, maybe this is like a private discussion, but air conditioning filters the air also? All the air handlers filter the air. The, okay, so all so the, air, okay. air conditioning doesn't further filter it. Okay. It just cools it. Everyone it's thinks it dehumidifies it. It really yeah. doesn't. It just feels cooler. Oh. And, you know, the other challenge we, we are faced with is that as the programs change, uh, everything from athletics to um, special needs, um, we have tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment that we struggle to find places to put. You saw the stuff in the halls. Uh, I work with Mike Legage on an annual basis of trying to figure out where to put all the athletic equipment. There isn't enough space to store stuff. And when pressured, I, I would love to get the facilities uh, shop out of the high school because that would free up space for Mike's athletics, maybe Sue's STEM classes um, with renovation. Again, no renovation for storage, but certainly renovation for uh, there's there's no absolute need that we would have to stay in the in that building. It's just where we are. Um, we'd need our own little warehouse, cheap kind of bu building that would accommodate us. It, it's heated and lockable for all of our equipment, but 
Um, the high school is a big building with possibility. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, other than eight corners, are the lot sizes sufficient for all of the schools when you're contemplating additions? No. What, what schools are challenged? Uh, Pleasant Hill is the most challenged. You're on a postage stamp and you have a big grade drop off. So if you were to do anything out back, it would be significant site work to try and keep it up to the same grade as that school. You also have neighbors who don't like the school there. I complain a lot. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's the guilty. Right? No, Bruce is a name me. And Blue Point is an odd site that abuts the marsh, and it's built into a hill. So if you if you walk down the hall, you literally are going down steps and ramps to to get to the end of the hall. And when you get down to the end where the trailers are, before you go out to the playground, you take another step down, and then you go down a really big hill to get to this playground, which is basically a mosquito swamp. Um, so to, to add there, you'd have to basically put an unattached building on the upper playground right out by the road. And that just doesn't make sense. So uh, all the sites are remarkably challenged. Eight Corners is the most uh, feasible, but again, not perfect. Um, but but it, it, does, it did have the most potential for us to try and cure that. Does, does the Harem and, um, proposal include anything addressing the middle school traffic issues? Yes. It does. It includes uh, making a road actually go all the way out and connect to Sawyer. Okay. So um, it would alleviate that everybody's in and out that same pinch point at the bottom of that, well, where the middle school sign is and that mm -hmm. granite sign. Everyone's got to go in and out there uh, along with the buses. Whereas if you had a through road, people could drop off and just keep going out and continue on from there. And just so, to yeah. give you um, a, a little perspective on that, during the comprehensive planning that the, that the town did, I went to a bunch of those sessions and they had big maps you could draw on and say like, what were the needs and what did you like? And you could use all these sticky dots. And I put at a road from the middle school out to Sawyer. <laughs> Somebody wrote on it, never. <laughs> There's a passion behind that. Guess too. we know how to feel about that, do we? <laughs> I remember seeing yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pub like, uh, public hey, safety. Supposed to be brainstorming. I'm like, hey. <laughs> public safety has has even looked to see if we could, you know, just come in and bust through over to Green Needle. Just something that gives you a an emergency out. If you had a real emergency yeah, there, there's there's no way out. You're stuck in there. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes public safety can't get in for an emergency because of traffic. Right. That's that's an alarming thing. So, yeah. Any other questions? And I welcome them anytime via email or whatever if you have questions. on Maybe the long range planning committee, this is more your thing, but I wonder, can you give us like a, like a timetable of how Wentworth started? Like how did the build, oh, what was question. the beginning of the building committee and like mm -hmm. how did it, I mean the second time, I guess. Yeah. How did that <laughs> process, you know, just so that we have mm -hmm. a timeline and, and mm -hmm. we can kind of see what's been done in the past and what we would need to do to get that started. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we can, we can re, we re leave that. Relive relive that. Recreate. It was recreate that night. Lots please. of, lots of, I, not specifically, meetings. but just like I said, we need to know where we need, we need yeah. to know where we need to start. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, it's four years, two years of planning, two years of construction. Yeah. That's the way it worked for Wentworth. Plus to make it simple. Negotiation. And one yeah. year, <laughs> right. it took a year to convince the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Five. Yep. So thank you very much, Todd. Yeah, thank thank you. Very you. Good job. It's very well. And it's always exciting to think yep. about what could be. Yeah. We're just going to take a small break before we start our 7 o'clock meeting.
the shift between the workshop to the actual business meeting. Um, but thank you for your patience as we relined ourselves. Um, are there adjustments to the agenda tonight? Yes, there are two adjustments. Um, in addition, 5.8 will be select superintendent interview committee members, and 5.9 will be um, a couple of student recognitions. Thank you. Um, 3.0, public comment on the agenda items. If you could state your name, your address, and if you could direct the comments towards. Sure. Hi. Hello, Carrie Lifers. I'm on Hunter Point Drive. And I'm just here tonight to ask you to be very thoughtful as the district chooses a new high school principal. This school year, as the dust has settled, our community, and most importantly, our students, have begun to return to a sense of normalcy. The high school, by all accounts, is once again a well-functioning, healthy place to work and learn. I believe this is largely due to the leadership of Sue Ketch, a talented administrator who lives in Scarborough and who has worked in Scarborough schools for over 30 years. My hope is that the district will ask her and she will agree to stay on as principal for at least the next few years. When I think back to last year and all the turmoil, it makes me quite literally nauseous to think about returning to even a semblance of that climate in our town. I know many of you may feel I was partly responsible for that climate, and to the extent that I could have done things differently to avoid the situation, I apologize. What I won't apologize for is the one thing that I refused to compromise on, I wanted our district's grading to be equitable and meaningful, but I was willing to compromise on proficiency-based education. You all know how strongly I felt and still feel about healthy school start times. I was publicly mocked on social media for how strongly I felt about start times, but I was willing to compromise. The one thing that I wasn't willing to compromise on is the issue that is on your agenda tonight. I hope that you'll ask yourselves why I might have been willing to put my th myself through what I went through last spring when I could have potentially ended the petitions, the hearings, the recalls by giving in. Why would I have compromised on an issue as near and dear to my heart as start times, and yet still not be willing to concede on one other issue? It wasn't on a whim. It wasn't motivated by any personal animus. It was because I believed the greater good was served by staying strong on that issue, even though it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through in my life. I was charged with acting in the best interests of the students, and I took that charge seriously. Now you're charged with the same responsibility. I hope you'll be thoughtful. I hope you'll reflect on the peacefulness of this year for our students and for our town. I hope you'll ask yourself, even if you disagree with every stance I've ever taken, if one individual is important enough, absolutely vital enough to our schools that it is worth throwing our community back into even a fraction of what we all went through last year. Do you want our amazing schools to be back on the front page of the newspaper for all the wrong reasons? Is it truly acting in the best interests of our students to risk that? Our district has been through and is continuing to go through a lot of change. We have a new school board. We, have a, we will have a new superintendent. Would it not be in the best interests of our students to keep Sue Ketch on as principal? Someone who is not an unknown quantity or who will have an unknown effect on our school system and our community, but who has proven herself over 30 plus years of service and has led our high school back to stability and health over the past several months a daunting task by any measure in the aftermath of last year. I ask you to be thoughtful in approaching the issue and weigh what might be the personal preference of some against the continued well-being and healing of our community and especially our students, whose best interests are now your highest responsibility. I hope that the superintendent will ask Sue Ketch to stay on and I hope she will have your blessing in continuing to do what's best for our students. Six Haystack Drive. I see Six Haystack Circle. <laughs> um, uh, I can't speak nearly as eloquently as Carrie Leifer did, but I just um, I came to speak on the agenda item regarding the high school principal. Uh, I do not know what your plans are, um, who's applied, etc. But um, as both a high school parent and as a former board member, I wholeheartedly support asking the interim principal Sue Ketch to stay on as high school principal. She took on the role during, during a terribly turbulent time, and she has gained the confidence of the entire school community. Um, she has shown her commitment to our schools, as, as Carrie eloquently said, her 30-year commitment. Uh, she attends 
games, concert, plays with great regularity. I, I, I think I, I don't know if I've been to any event without seeing Sue there. Um, she's warm and friendly, presence in our schools. She cares about our kids deeply and is so easy to work with. In short, she's everything we would want in a high school principal. And with a superintendent search, I feel like having that stability would really help our town. Um, I really hope that you will really consider keeping her at the helm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Hi, uh, John Clutchy. I don't have a prepared statement, but I did want to offer two pieces of advice. Um, the first, uh, when you put out the agenda and you have a topic on it like high school principal, you might want to elaborate a little bit because it's a hot button topic in town right now. Um, and that could help uh, calm some of the tension, I think, around uh, the issue. And the other thing I want to say is what Sue Ketch did by stepping into this role this year is commendable. Uh, she willingly went into a burning house and helped to bring it back together and, and calm things back down. So but whatever you, your position may be, I think she deserves a lot of respect um, for having done what she did this year. Hi, my name is Cindy Kuick. I'm at 6 Moores Point Road. I'm here tonight because the agenda item was the high school principal. Um, <clears throat> I have to concur with some of the other people who have spoken tonight. Last year was pretty miserable. It was an awful year. Uh, I, quite frankly, really didn't know Mr. Creech. Um, I don't really know Ms. Mrs. Ketch that much either. But what I can tell you as a parent of a high school student and a parent of a middle school student that the atmosphere in the town and the school last year was horrible and the atmosphere in the school this year is normal and wonderful and it's actually focused on kids learning and it's not focused on one person's uh, employment issues which I felt like it never really should have been. Uh, so with a new superintendent coming in next year I'm really very concerned about two big changes happening at the same time. I have no idea if Sue Ketch is even interested in staying for another year. If we could get her to stay for another year, that would be wonderful to at least have that consistency. And then if she wanted to stay, terrific. If not, and you had to hire somebody else, at least let's try to have another year of peace before we have more turmoil at the high school. Thanks a lot. Okay, there's no other comments. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn to an executive session pursuant to MRSA 4056A to discuss a personnel issue to return to public session? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous. Okay. We'll be back.
5.0, new business. 5.1, the Scarborough High School principal position. Yes, so it is the time of year where folks are beginning to ask about what's happening next with our high school principal. Um, as we all know, Sue Ketch has been serving the high school as interim principal this year. And we do have a search committee that um, worked on the process last year. They also recently reconvened. And my recommendation is for the search committee to come back together um, and to uh, work on the process of hiring an, a principal, a full-time principal for the high school for the upcoming school year. Um, the recommendation that initially came from the search committee was to offer Principal Ketch another year as interim principal. And although Sue is more than willing and able to do whatever it is that the high school needs, um, she felt it was not in the best interest for the students to serve, or the staff, to serve as an interim for one more year. And so we really want the search committee to come back together with that new information um, to be able to reassess where we are and what our best next step would be with the ultimate goal in mind of being able to appoint a high school principal or make a recommendation to this board to appoint a high school principal no later than May 2nd. And so we wanted to take tonight to just let the community know where we are because I know folks have been emailing and wondering and asking. Um, and so that's our, our current status at the moment. And we do want to just thank Principal Ketch for your continued service. Um, as our high school principal, it really doesn't go unnoticed how hard you're working and the good things that you're doing for our community. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, moving on, 5.2, it's a second reading of policy ABC, the tobacco and vapor producing products, possession and exposure. Um, this has been posted online, so for the folks at home and here, I'm not going to read it. Um, it is lengthy. We completely overhauled it. Um, I want to make sure that you know everybody here has had a chance to look it over if they have questions. Um, yes, thank you. Excellent. And to publicly thank both Alicia and Amy, um, this was a huge endeavor. It took a long time to rewrite this um, to bring us up to current current standards um, with what is really becoming quite the epidemic with vaping. So with that, if there's a motion to accept the updated policy ABC for tobacco and vapor producing products, possession and exposure. So moved. Second. Discussion? I think I would just add a thank you to the board for the work on this policy. It was really tricky to get current with the language and learn about all the lingo that students are using so that the policy would be relevant and meaningful. Um, I also believe that there's some legislation uh, about vaping and on school mm -hmm. grounds that, so I'm sure that we'll be updating it soon. Um, but it feels good to finally have a policy in place that's current um, and then we can update our signage on campus so that um, both our students, our, or I would say our students, our staff, and the folks who are attending events at our schools know that it's absolutely something that's not acceptable um, in the same way that using tobacco products is not. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we're ready to vote, all those in favor of accepting the policy as written? It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Um, 5.3 is a second reading of the 2019-2020 school calendar. Do we have a motion to accept the second reading of the 2019-2020 school calendar? So moved. So moved. Second. Any, any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> I said everything I was going to say last week. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. That's all I'll say. Thank <laughs> you, Hillary. Yeah. Yes. Um, in that case, um, if there is no discussion, I believe we're ready to vote. All those in favor of the calendar as written? Again, unanimous. I'd like to bundle um, 5.4, the meeting minutes for the workshop of January 3rd. 5.5, the meeting minutes for the business section of January 3rd. 5.6, the meeting minutes for the workshop on January 17th. And 5.7, meeting minutes for the business meeting on January 17th into one motion to accept as written. So, so moved. moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. 5.8. You can get to the next slide. This is so exciting. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, this is kind of the fun part. We get to um, formally select the folks who will be part of the superintendent search committee. Um, before we open up to the selection um, itself, I I'd like to apologize. Um, there was a misstep in how we communicated the dates. It was not uniform on the time commitment and the dating, and for that we apologize. Um, the first meeting for the committee members will be next Thursday night. Five o'clock to seven is a workshop. Um, and just to share, we had 44 total respondents, which was a really good turnout. Um, we have a student who was interested, seven <coughs> teachers, and I won't break down to each of the phase levels, six staff members, four administrators, and 26 community members who have volunteered your time and your expertise to help us in searching for a new superintendent. The committee met last night, and per the unanimous vote on the board, um, the demographics of the 17-person committee will be as follows. One board member, and Alicia was named as our board member, one student, two central office administrators, three teachers, one from the three phase levels, three staff members also from the phase levels, the three administrators, and four community members. Um, we'll be drawing those randomly tonight. So again, everybody who um, had volunteered, thank you so much. And Sarah has the envelopes. You get a color. You get a <laughs> uh, so we'll do this one by one. So high school staff. We we'll use the machine for the big one. We want two in here. <laughs> William York. Excellent. High school teacher. There's only one in there. Oh, there's one. I think I would look. I'm not. I can't get one. Sarah Blaisdell. Anne Lalaberti. <coughs> Anne Lalaberti. <coughs> Bullet. Did I say that right? Oh, sorry. The Liberty. And then Mrs. Middle School staff. No. Uh, Amy Roberson. And middle school teacher. Carol of Flame. that if we could draw two alternate alternates yeah. just in case. Don't do it so hard. Just do it like once or you know. It's Joanne old now. Joanne has the. Experience. I have experience, it, but it's old. <laughs> I think she's giving up on the oh, barrel. Oh. I guess we'll have to auction that off now. Yeah. <laughs> Diane, you need, to, you need to buy it. <laughs> Diane's, Diane's been giving that up. That's about 20 something years old. Just use it. That's like 70D40, I think. We're just not User error. Will Rowan? Carrie Golder. Ooh, that's four. And we'll do two up two. Yes, please. Uh, Liam Somers. Cindy Kuak. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. 
Are the options? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much again for everybody who had volunteered. Cindy, congratulations. All right. Um, the last piece is two student recognitions. I know that recognitions are really next week that we do this, but this is a big weekend for some sports teams. Um, Scarborough Wrestling, near and dear to my heart. Huge congratulations to Addison Boy there. Um, he is the second student um, in our history who has qualified for the New England Wrestling Tournament. Um, the beautiful part of this photo, as you can see, this is when he won a state championship. Um, the coach on the right, Mike Sear, was our first. So it's pretty impressive that Coach Sear has come back. He is sharing That's his great. knowledge and is helping Addison get ready to go to Providence this weekend. Huge luck. And congratulations. And who's that hugging Addison? Um, <laughs> that is Coach Morishi. Um, he is our newest coach. Um, he's from Iowa. He was a 113 wrestler, and you know Addison's on our 285 side. So <laughs> that um, is so cute. I so love this you, photo. Did you make that clear that he won the state champion? Yes. In his I, weight class. Okay, because yeah. that's. I thought awesome. I had. Um, Yes. And now he's moving on to the and new he's moving on to That is the best picture. It's a great picture. It yeah. is yeah. the most incredible picture. Um, so when this happened, I didn't realize that Jason Jenner had actually caught it, but was crying as I was filming it for his parents, mm -hmm. because just the excitement for all of them. And if you know Addison, he is the quietest boy in the world. So for him to show that level of emotion was huge. And last but definitely not least, huge Congratulations and best of luck to the girls this weekend at the state basketball game. Again, huge testament to their grit and determination. Can I speak to that for a bit? Absolutely. I am so excited for these girls. Um, my daughter played with them for three years, and I know them very well. And I, they're just a great group of young women. They're such good kids and great school citizens. And I can't be happier. For, for, the, for them and what they've accomplished this year. I cannot wait to go to the game. It's going to be so much fun. Saturday at 6.30? I was going to say, can we get the, can we get Saturday, the plug? <laughs> Saturday at 6. I think they're selling tickets. Mike, are they selling tickets? Did they sell them tonight? Yep. Yeah. So, okay. So And then now they go to the Civic Center to get them? Yeah. It's going to be a good game. Great game. The Civic Center, the same thing as the Cross Insurance Arena. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aging myself. I know, I know. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, at 6.0, this might be a record for us. Um, motion to adjourn? So moved. so moved. All those in favor? Fantastic. Oh, thank second. You. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, I did not say that. I got to say that.